Yes. Would, would you stand up and say a quick prayer? Yes. <coughs> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. Axiolus nostros quesimus domini esperando proveni et ibando prosecere contu nostro operatio te sem principia, et percepta suniatur per Christum Dominum nostro. Amen. Immaculate Mediatrix of all graces. Amen. Holy Father St. Francis. Amen. Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, just before I start, who here has actually considered the third order before? Okay, so very few of you. So you're here just to learn about it. You've not heard about the third order. Well, the first thing I want to do, there's been several, and you can find these. There's little cards. Just to mention, too, there's these things here. Uh, just some books we usually carry around that, are, uh, that we find to be good books. There's miraculous medals that are blessed. There's scapulars that are blessed. Uh, feel free to take anything. Uh, for the books, if you want to leave a donation, they help us buy more books, but I'm not interested either way. So. Uh, but there are cards there, and there's also pens, so if you want us to pray for anything, uh, write down your prayer request, and we have a little place in our chapel where we'll, we'll put those prayers. Um, but on the website, we have three encyclicals. There's three encyclicals that were written by popes. They're the ones who write encyclicals. And they're all about the Third Order of St. Francis, and they're just beautifully written. So I'm going to go through some of the quotes from these, trying to string together, basically summing up these three, using their words instead of mine to start with, just because I think it'll, it'll give you a, a clearer idea with very beautiful language of exactly what the third order is and why. And please, if you have questions, I'll take those after I stop at different sections. Your, your questions usually help me... Um, guide things in a, in a way that's actually going to be appropriate for what you are interested in or what you're not, what's not becoming clear by what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so first I would start by, uh, we, we remember our Lord, the first words that our Lord said in the gospel is repent. You know, especially in, in the gospel of Mark and in Matthew. So I'll read them both just to bring it back. So, and after that, John was delivered up. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is accomplished and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And then again in Matthew, it says, in that time, after coming out of the desert, Jesus began to preach and he would say, repentance for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. So repent and do penance Later, when he's talking about St. John the Baptist, who had just been taken into custody, and he said, and from the days of John, taken that he might have already just been martyred as well, but, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent, violent bear it away. Here, at least in the Dewey Reims, the uh, <clears throat> suffereth violence, it has to do with penance and mortification, uh, especially the mortification of our of our inclinations towards sin. So anyone who actually does um, battles with themselves to fight against their inclinations towards sin does a great violence to overcome those things. Because it's not like we just say, I'm just going to stop doing that. You have to actually go, go to war with yourself. So if this, in the time of our dear blessed Lord was to bring about the conversion of many Jews, because in fact, many people did follow our Lord. I mean, you have him feeding 4,000, 7,000. He's feeding all these different people at different times. Uh, that, that call for penance wasn't just for then. We know that, and we hear it in at Mass that we're supposed to repent and we're supposed to do penance. But if we ask ourselves sincerely, we really just don't do that most of the time. We're not a very penitential people, especially being Americans. We just aren't. And I think we just have to be honest about the fact. Could, could it be said to us, as St. John the Baptist had said to the Pharisees and the scribes, 
you brood of vipers, who hath, who hath showed you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of penance. I mean, he called them a brood of vipers. It's fantastic to listen to it. We, we listened to it in the, in the friary. There was a dramatic representation of scriptures. So it's actually, it's actually quite nice because you have different people reading the different parts and things like that. So we listen to it while we're having our meals. But it's wonderful when you get St. John the Baptist. Just, they come out to visit him and he starts yelling on calling brood of vipers. But I really do think we would probably get some of the wrath from these saints saying that we're professed baptized, confirmed Catholics. But what penance do we do? What are we doing to actually pick up a cross and follow our Lord? And in fact, most of us really do live as hypocrites. The tone, now here's some of the encyclicals. I'm going to read, I don't like to normally do this, but I'm going to do it because these encyclicals, like I, I mentioned, they're very powerful. So for a couple minutes, we'll jump from, I'll sum basically all of these encyclicals up. Um, these are encyclicals from Leo the Thirteenth, Benedict the Fifteenth, and uh, Pius the Eleventh. Okay? Like I said, on the website, if you go under the third order, go all the way down to the bottom of the page, and you have all three of these encyclicals you can get right there. You can just click on it. You can download the thing. I encourage you to read them. They're fantastic. If you want to learn about St. Francis, He's not really just talking about the Third Order. He's talking about St. Francis, what St. Francis did. We'll try to sum that up here, but you really just can't replace these encyclicals. Each one of them, is they're just precious to read. They're written in such a manly way, the way the Pope used to write before. They're not these 50-page encyclicals. They're very short uh, and concise, and they have very beautiful uh, information. So the fact is that you know, Christians today have grown cold, and most of us are quite ignorant of what it means to be a Christian. Remember, we don't come from a Christian culture. America isn't a Christian culture. At least it's not a Catholic culture. But it's not much different as Leo the Thirteenth, as well as Benedict the the Fifteenth uh, and Pius the Eleventh say, the time that St. Francis lived in isn't all that much different than the time that we lived in. And Saint Leo, or not Saint, but Leo the Thirteenth says, the tone and temper of our times seems by seems for many reasons to be similar to those for such as in the twelfth century, divine charity had grown cold. So also it is now. Nor is the neglect the neglect of Christian duty small, whether from ignorance or negligence, and with the same bent. And like desires, many consume their days in hunting for conveniences of life and greedily following after pleasures. Overflowing with luxury, they waste their own and covet the substance of others, extolling indeed the name of human fraternity. They nevertheless speak more fraternally than they act, for they are carried away by self-love and the genuine charity towards the poor and the helpless is daily diminished. In the time we are speaking of, the manifold errors of the Albigenses, by stirring up the masses against the powers of the church, had disturbed society and paved the way to a kind of socialism. All right. Can you see that today? And in our day, likewise, the favorers and propagators of materialism have increased, who obstinately deny that submission to the church is due, and hence proceeding gradually beyond all bounds, do not even spare the civil power. They approve of violence and seditions among the people. They attempt, uh, they attempt agrarian outbreaks that flatter the desires of the uh, proliterates and uh, they weaken the foundation of domestic and public order. This is from Aspicato Concensum, Leo the Thirteenth. It sounds a bit like today, doesn't it? it? Sounds a whole lot like today. And that's what he said was going on at the time of St. Francis. See, we're ignorant. We don't think that about the time of St. Francis. 
We think that people are happy with their carts going down the road and singing some of the psalms, and you had, and they're just, you, it was nice and happy, or people were just dirty all the time because it was the dark ages. We, we just have a silly idea of how things were. Actually, capitalism in some capacity started to rise up. St. Francis was not a nobleman, but yet St. Francis was rich. His dad was a cloth merchant. So he was able to increase their livelihood and become important in society based on their wealth. And the father wanted St. Francis to follow along the same road. And St. Francis was willingly doing so, but he didn't care about money. So he would just, he was the, he, they called him the, um, the king of the youth because he would lead all the youth around. They even gave him a scepter and he would, he, they, would they would parade through the streets because he would buy them all drinks and food. St. Francis was not a great sinner though he referred to his whole life as something of sin. He wasn't somebody that was going out carousing and doing other things. He was just, he was just, you know, an easygoing guy that liked spending his father's money on all of his friends. And so all of his friends really liked him. But in that time of the feudal system, you had, you had a class system. But because of the wealth and the affluency of the time, the luxury of the time, it allowed for people to actually do for themselves and grow through business and become rich and amass a wealth so that they had a bit more position within society. A bit like what we have today. Ours is much more exacerbated, but it's, it's, it's much the same. He continues, certainly the greatest origin both of evils, uh, both of evils which press us and the dangers which are feared is the, ne is the neglect of virtue by Christians. That's the greatest thing that we should fear. Remember St. Bernadette? She said the thing that she feared most, and that was a very revolutionary time they were living through. The thing she feared most was bad Catholics. It is, he says, in this century appeared St. Francis, yet with wondrous resolution and simplicity he undertook to place before the eyes of an aging world. Now that's important. Things just seem so old to us. There's no hope for a future, it seems right now. They're burning cities down for things that don't even make any sense. You see these, uh, the, the people that took over like Portland. I watched a, a small video, an interview with this lady. She was one of the leaders that took over that little city in Portland. I'm sure you all know a lot more about it than I do. And they asked her about it. She's acting all confident, saying, we've got to burn everything down. We've got to get everybody out of the jails. We've got to, do, do, we've got to get rid of the police. And we've got to liquidate the, 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 the judicial, judicial system. And then, then the guy interviewing said, and then? She's like, what do you mean, then? I don't know. This is the kind of people we have there. We don't even know what we want to do. We just know we have to break everything. That's old. We have no future. There's no hope. There's nothing young and beautiful in our culture right now. It's just, it's just, it's in demise. And so he set the set before his aging world, in his words and deeds, the complete model of Christian perfection. To give it something that makes it young again, Christian perfection. Something that gives it hope. Pius XI admonishes us, it seems necessary for us to affirm that there has never been anyone in whom the image of Jesus Christ and the evangelical manner of life shone forth more lifelike and strikingly than in St. Francis. It's a big thing to say with all the saints out there. It's a big thing to say. He who called himself the herald of the great king, who also spoke, rightly spoke, was rightly spoken of as another Jesus Christ, that's what they said about St. Francis. Appearing to his contemporaries and to future generations almost as if he were the risen Christ. It's the Pope writing that. The Pope wrote that. And so as, as Christ, he inspired the Jews to repent. He preached, he preached the doctrine of repentance once that world had grown cold again, and they'd forgotten about that through their everyday, mundane Catholic experience, they forgot that they had to do penance. 
Everything started to grow cold again because they weren't striving for perfection. You can't have people striving for perfection if they're not doing penance. Look at those little children at Fatima. What our lady have them do? It seems absurd that Jacinta, while she's dying in a, in a hospital bed, had a cord around her waist with blood all over it, and she had to take it off when Lucia came to visit her and give it to her and say, don't let anybody find this. I don't want them to see this. She was half dead in her bed, and she's still doing penance. What's that make you think about the penance you're doing? She would get up in the middle of the night, though she was wasted away to a skeleton, and she would try to kneel down. She told Lu Lucia this one, one morning, or one day when Lucia came to visit. She didn't get to visit much, remember, because Jacinta had to go off. She, it was the one thing she didn't want to do. She didn't want to die by herself. And what did Our Lady ask her to do? You're going to have to go away and die by yourself. Don't think that God abandoned you because you don't get what you want. That's what we're all tempted to think today. So just, just, Jacinta would get up in the middle of the night, though she could barely move. She was dying. Her, she had a festering wound in her side that wouldn't go away. She had an infection all through. She would climb out of bed, and she would try to prostrate the way the angel taught him to and say the prayer. But since she couldn't do that, she said she would fall on her head. Right? Just you can see how cute this little girl was. She, I can't do that, so I just kneel there and say it. Well, Luc Luc Lucia, she went to tell the confessor, and he said, Father said, you're not allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> so mm -hmm. She had to stay in her bed. She wasn't allowed to do that penance mm -hmm. anymore. But it, it shows you how she was asked to do those things by our lady. She was seven. So to re-inspire this in those people who had fallen away, from this life of perfection, this life of penance that Christ himself preached to us, he sent St. Francis into the world, right? But he didn't just send St. Francis. St. Francis was already there. St. Francis is just like us. St. Francis is probably worse than some of you young men here because he was out there in the streets running around. They'd be singing these, these carols through the streets. I don't know if you, who's been to Assisi? You see how, if you, if you think about being in the middle of the street there in a CC and start singing at the top of your lungs at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's just going to echo between all the windows. You can imagine, if you're in one of those rooms, you're not going to like that guy. That's who St. Francis was for these people, though he, had, he did have a good reputation. So it's not like our Lord picked this, this guy that was already just pure as can be, at least in intention. St. Francis was not, probably never fell into mortal sin, no matter what strange movie you watch. Probably never fell into mortal sin. But St. Francis still had to go through a whole process of conversion. But that process of conversion, it came about for the simple fact that he decided to cooperate with grace. And that's what grace did with him. And then in the end, God stamped into his flesh his holy wounds. That's why St. Francis had the stigmata. Not just because it was some strange gift that he wanted to give the... He's the first out of so many. That's true. He is the first out of so many if St. Paul didn't have it. But he didn't just get stamped with the holy stigmata just for some interesting gift from God. He got stamped, as St. Bonaventure says in his great work, the uh, Legenda the Maior, the, the, great, the major life of St. Francis... In that life, he goes through to show, in that beautiful short work, if you haven't read it, I really encourage you to get it. You can buy these copies online. They cost almost nothing nowadays. He shows how St. Francis was stamped with a stigmata because he had conformed himself perfectly to Christ and him crucified, just like we're all supposed to do. We're all supposed to do it. Now, Leo the 13th, goes on to tell us about this Christian perfection. Now the perfection of Christian virtue lies in that disposition of soul which dares all that is arduous and difficult. Its symbol is the cross which those who, who would follow Jesus Christ must carry on their shoulder. The effects of this disposition are a heart detached from mortal things, complete self-control, and a gentle, resigned endurance of adversity. Those are things to meditate on every day, every day. 
The effects of this disposition of heart are detachment from mortal things, complete self-control, and a gentle and resigned endurance of adversity. We know what it's like when we get adversity. Maybe one we can handle, then the second one we're weeping, and the third one we're asking God, why is he treating us that way? You know I'm not. You, you, you know it's not a lot. We're all, we're all there. Most of us don't take much, much, much difficulty, and that's why God doesn't give us much difficulty anymore. If you were to accept difficulty, God would give it to you because you would save abundant souls by accepting it. That's why Our Lady said that we have to do a lot of penance and pray because nobody's praying for those. They're sinners and they're just going to hell. Right? That's what that all means. In fine, the love of God and of, of one's neighbor is the mistress and, and sovereign of all other virtues. Such is the power that it wipes away all the hardship that accompany the fulfillment of duty and renders the hardest labors not only bearable, but agreeable. Therefore, Pius the, uh, the Pius XI in Riti Expiatis, he writes this, as a matter of fact, by his, by his practice of all the virtues in a heroic manner, by the austerity of his life and his preaching of penance, by his manifold and restless activities for the re reformation of society, the figure of Francis stands forth in all its completeness, proposed to, not, uh, to, to us not so much for the admiration as for the imitation of Christian peoples. As the herald of the great king, his purposes were directed to persuading men to conform their lives to the dictates of evangelical sanctity and to the love of the cross. You know, often we hear about penance, we hear, you know, we hear it from the pulpit often, and it's right, that when we hear about these extreme penances that a lot of the saints are doing, we say that that's for our admiration, not for our imitation. Right? Yeah, taking the discipline to blood every single night, St. John Mary Vianney, and many other saints. That's for our admiration, but not for our imitation. Well, here the Pope is saying, St. Francis and all the extreme stuff he did, not so much for our admiration, but for the, for the imitation of all Christian peoples. But he said, for the reformation of society. And this is what would transform. If you want to know, how do you transform the society? If you have a bunch of Christians who are doing their duty and striving for Christian perfection, everything will change. Because you're not afraid to die. If you're not afraid to die, what are you going to be attached to? But right now you're attached to so many things and you're afraid to die. And so? And so Benedict XV says, In truth, what is at hand definitively is by imitation of, of Francis of Assisi to open to the greatest possible number of souls the way which will lead them back to Christ. It is... Uh, it is in this return that resides the firmest hope of salvation for society the words of St. Paul be my imitators as I myself am of Christ that's 1 Corinthians 11 we can with good right put upon the lips of St. Francis who in imitating the apostle has become the most faithful image and copy of Jesus Christ St. Francis has become the most faithful and perfect copy, faithful copy, or image of Jesus Christ. That's in Sacro Propendium of Benedict XV. In conclusion, all these, uh, these writings, there's a couple more, but... In Aspicato Concensum of Leo XIII, for these reasons it has been long and, uh, long and especially our desire that everyone should to the utmost of his power aim at imitating St. Francis of Assisi. Therefore, as hitherto, we have always bestowed special care upon the third order of St. Francis. So now, being called by the supreme mercy of God 
to the, to the office of the uh, sovereign pontiff, since thereby we can most opportunely do the same, we exhort Christian men not to refuse to enroll themselves in the sacred army of Jesus Christ. Many are those who everywhere of both sexes have already begun to walk in the footsteps of the seraphic father with courage and alacrity, with zeal we praise and especially commend. So that, venerable brethren, we desire that by your endeavors especially it may be increased and extended to many. And the special point which we commend is that those who have adopted the insignia of penance shall look to the image of its most holy founder and strive to imitate him without which the good that they would expect would be futile. Now remember, a few ladies out there, because you're Americans, most women nowadays, maybe none of you, but most women get upset when they just hear, for men, they think it doesn't have to do with you. God created the male and female and called them man. All right? and just Whenever the Pope refers to that, we don't have this gender or whatever, all this uh, inclusive language and stuff, because you can't talk about men without talking about women. Because he made them male and female and called them man. Them, man. And so what is the third order? Pope Benedict the 15th tells us, profoundly saddened by the misfortunes which the church was then passing through, Francis convinced, conceived the in, uh, incredible design of renewing everything conformably to the principles of the Christian law. After having founded a double religious family, one of brothers and the other of sisters, who pledged themselves by solemn vows to imitate the humility of the cross, Francis, in the, in the impossibility of opening the cloister to all whom desired of being formed in his school, drew, uh, in his school drew to him, resolved to procure even for souls living in the whirlpool of the world, the means to tend to Christian perfection. He founded then an order, not a club, an order, properly called tertiaries, differing from the two other orders in that it would not bear the bond of the religious vows, but would be characterized by the same simplicity of life in the same spirit of penance. Thus the project, which no founder of a religious order had yet imagined, to cause the religious life to be practiced by all. Francis first conceived the idea and of the grace of God gave him to realize it with the greatest success. We have no other proof of it than this beautiful homage of Thomas of Chilano the very first uh, biographer of St. Francis, who was a companion and knew him personally. Actual companion. Ordered by the Pope to write it. Marvelous workman, whose example, direction, and teaching had this admirable result to renew in both sexes the Church of Christ and to lead to triumph a triple phallus of souls, that means a body of troops, preoccupied with their salvation. Sacro compendium, uh, propendium uh, number five. So what's the rule? What's the rule that they have to follow? Because remember, he, he, three different orders. An order has a rule that they have to follow. Simply put, this is what Leo the Thirteenth says. For its rule consists only in obedience to God and his church to avoid factions and quarrels, and in no way to defraud our neighbor, to take up arms only for the defense of religion and one's country, to be moderate in food and in clothing, to shun luxury and to abstain from the dangerous seductions of dances and plays. Gregory the Ninth, who knew St. Francis, but the... 
became pope when the third order was already quite large and was all over Europe. He said this. So Gregory the Ninth publicly praised their faith and courage, nor did he hesitate to shelter them with his authority and to call them a mark uh, as a mark of honor, soldiers of Christ and the new Maccabees. So, so the third order, you can see there that the third order is something that was conceived by St. Francis to respond to his great desire to reform everything in Christ. You know, that, those were the words, wasn't that was the, the cry of Pius X, wasn't it? To restore everything in Christ. St. Francis, when he would go preaching from town to town, the people, as it said in there, they saw him as the risen Christ. They saw him as the man of the Beatitudes. They saw him as that refreshing, youthful dignity of our faith that people were longing for because things had grown old. When they were, you know, people were trying to become rich, they're, 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 they're chasing after the material things and no longer the spiritual things. This was a culture that still had at the center of it Christ. It was a Christocentric society. And that's why whenever you had heresy, it disrupted the entire culture. And that's why the authorities would actually punish somebody for heresy because it led to disorder. We don't understand that because we don't come from that culture. We think, well, everybody's like half heretical today. And that's the whole thing. It's like everything is basically heretical. You, you're, you're like swimming in heresy trying to find the truth. Back then, you lived by the truth because Christ was the center of the government. He was the center of the church. He was the center of every Christian's life. That means he was the center of the entire culture. Everything revolved around Christ. Back then, every Christian knew the Psalms and basically by heart, they would sing them wherever they went. They didn't have all the famous, I don't know who the famous singers are today, but they didn't have them. They had, they had King David. And they just knew all of those songs were always going about praising God. Well, that was still, there were still remnants of that. There was still that, the heartfelt desire for that. But in fact, the whole structure, the whole foundation was crumbling. And they could feel that it becoming wretched and decayed. So when St. Francis steps on the scene, there's this breath of fresh air. There's Christ. There's this dirty, humble friar who, who would just willingly strip off his habit and tie himself to a rock and preach about how he deserves to be beaten and flogged for his sins. And then everyone would see, but you're a saint. If you have to be beaten and flogged for your sins, what about my sins, who am not a saint? This was the St. Francis that walked in and out of every town. And when he did so, the people were convicted in their hearts like they were when they saw our dear blessed Lord. And as they would come up to our Lord and say, Lord, what must I do to follow you? They would do the same thing as St. Francis. But you have people now who are married. They have children. Well, you can't come into the cloister. You have your duties. You know, you, maybe, maybe some of you have even experienced it. The, the wife or the husband sometimes wants to go and do a little bit too much at church when they actually have duties at home. These, there's always a give and take that's always difficult in the family to know how much can I do at church? Where, where are all my duties? How can I make sure my duties are done so I can still do more at church? There's a balance that has to be because the duties are primary. And then the, the prayer comes later. Now today in America, especially in the traditional movement, so many lay people want to withdraw from the world and live like a religious. But that's not your job. And all the religious want to withdraw from the cloister and want to live out in the world. Everything's just perverted. It's all upside down. In fact, you all who live out in the world, in that whirlwind, as the popes referred to it as, you have a great sacrament confirmation that helps you to live out there and be Christ in the world. But the fact is that most of you don't represent Christ in the world because you're not living a true life of Christian perfection. Because in some regard, in different elements of your life, it's grown cold. Right? It's a reflection for all of us personally, individually. Where have I grown cold at? 
And, and don't think I'm just pointing the finger. We religious are constantly trying to reflect on this because we always tend downward just like everybody else. We have a rule of life. And we have to maintain that rule of life. And if we do, we're promised eternal life. You all don't necessarily have that. And that's what makes the world so dangerous. St. Francis saw that and realized the power that lay within the lay people. Now remember, lay people sometimes is considered by people today as like derogatory. Because everybody wants to be, they want to be up here at the pulpit. They want to be distributing communion. They want to, they want to have some kind of function, some ministry they call it. You know, we want to have our ministries. But the duty to, to, to become a saint, can you imagine? Can you imagine if the majority of people here, rather than being, as St. Uh, Leonard of Port Maurice would say, the majority being damned to hell would actually be saints? Can you imagine what we would do? Because sanctity, it just spreads. You get persecuted for it, but it spreads. And people are attracted to it. But often we kind of hide. We hide the fact that we're... We're Christians. We might have our crosses, you might see. We, we might openly say that we're something. But can they see it through our actions? Can they see it through our, we'll call them Christian smoke breaks, where we actually get to go, we, we go say our prayers every few minutes, where they're going to smoke their cigarettes every few minutes, we go to pray every few minutes. we gotta, we got to be in competition. So the third order, it was a rule of life. A rule that was established by St. Francis to give that rule, that order, that structure to a lay person's life so they can keep maintaining. When they start to tend downward, as we all do, they can keep climbing back up and stay at that rule. It gives them that structure for which to be Christ in the world. For which to live in a fraternity of people who are striving to make Christ present to the world. Does that make sense? Now, I didn't finish, but the, when you hear the word lay person, it comes from the laus tu teu. It's the Greek. It means basically the consecrated people of God. That's a beautiful thing. It's just in our language, in English, lay person just doesn't, all, it doesn't sound all that great, right? But it means you're the consecrated people of God. And that happens at your baptism. That's when you become part of the laus tu teu. So it's a life basically assuring you of time for prayer, penance, because there's fasting to be done and other penances, but it's always reminding you that penance needs to be done. Growth in virtue, detachment from earthly things, and attachment to heaven. Sometimes we're just not too attached to heaven. We just expect kind of to get there, right? But very few of us, besides in our words, really think about how we're looking forward to dying, right? We might say it, but how many of you are actually looking forward to dying? Hopefully it comes soon, right? Is that, does that ever happen in the family? Oh, hopefully I'll be dead soon. Not only because bad things are happening, but hopefully. Because like St. Pio, with St. Pio they said, um, one of the brothers went to him and said, oh, we're praying for you, you'll be with us a lot longer. And he scolded him and said, what are you doing? He said, you hate me? St. Pio was looking forward to dying because he wanted to go to heaven. This world really doesn't have a lot for us, but we want to be here as long as we're supposed to be here. But we should be making a purpose for the, 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 the wretched existence that we have to toil through. We should, make, we should make something good of it by first becoming a saint and dragging as many people to heaven as we possibly can. Then your life is worth something. Look at it. If you have some statues, you, you do something great, especially the young people. Most of you, who is homeschoolers? How many are homeschoolers? Probably the great majority. Some some are public schools, public schools. In public school, they tell you you're going to do something great. You're going to change the world, right? It's just a big lie. And everybody knows it's a big lie. Look, even if they make a statue of you someday, somebody's going to tear it down anyway. It's, <laughs> it's like you got no chance to leave a name for yourself unless you become a saint. So religious life, I'm sorry, the third order, it's not a club. It's not a group of people that you just kind of get together and say, hey, I like that group, and I like to go to the meetings with them because I really get along with them, and I like the way they, they kind of do stuff sometimes. No, it, it's because you want to you be religious. 
That means you want to be relegato a Dio. You want to be you want to be tied and bound to God. That's what religion means. You want to exercise in a greater way your consecration to God the virtue of religion to God, the sacrifice you offer to God. That's what you want to do. And so becoming a religious is binding yourself to Him in some special way. That's what the third order is for lay people. It's religious life for lay people. Though, it is not binding by sin, by pain of sin. Whereas we religious who take vows and separate ourselves from the world, our job is to be religious. Our job is to say our prayers. Our job is to get up in the middle of the night and to go to the chapel and pray for an hour and to go back to bed and then get up again and to deal with the brothers that live there that we don't like and the list goes on. Your job is to take care of your families, to go to work, to do what you're supposed to do. And if that gets in the way of your duties as a third order, it's not under the pain of sin. You strive to do that rule of life. And when your duties get in the way, you just very peacefully say, well, blessed be God forever. I can't do that right now. It becomes a penance not to be able to do your religious duties, which probably obtains a huge amount of grace for lay people. Doing what you ought to do over what you desire to do really can save a lot of souls without you doing almost anything to save them. Does that make sense? Jacinta had to suffer all that stuff. All we have to do is do what we're supposed to do. So it's not a club, it's religious life. It's a fraternity. It's difficult for fraternities today because like I'm getting people that are interested in the third order and they're contacting me from all over the world. Well, how do you do a third order for people all over the world? I know it's necessary because we're not gonna pull the culture out of the, the sewer unless we have third order members everywhere becoming saints everywhere, working out in the world, being Christ everywhere. Until that happens, things aren't going to change. That's what changed the feudal system. I don't know if you know that. The feudal system is what rose up after the whole Roman Empire collapsed. And it collapsed because of, dare I say, it was the sexual perversities of the time. It was also the matriarchs in the family. And the dog replaced the children. Sound a bit like today? So things got pretty out of hand and everything just fell apart. And when it all fell apart, there was nobody to defend. They didn't have the police. <laughs> so they didn't have the, the military wasn't functioning. You know? So what do they do? Feudal system starts. I'll protect you, you work my lands, but when I need to fight, you have to come take take up arms. And that's where the rule of St. Francis says you're not allowed to bear arms unless it's in defense of your faith or your country but not for some feudal lord. We, especially you younger people, in your lifetime, you may see some kind of feudal system start up again. Once the police are disbanded and the government is afraid to use force anymore and everything just disintegrates and falls apart, what are you going to have? You're going to have a tribal system and people are going to need to start taking care of each other. That little city there in Portland, they they started it up. They didn't have police there because they kicked the police out. So what do you do? They had a little gang go around and start doing extortion, say, we'll take care of your business if you pay us this much money. That's what's going to happen as the culture collapses. And don't think it's not close to collapsing. It's close. But what will rebuild it? The truth will rebuild it. We're the only ones that have that. We're Catholic. You're going to need the truth to rebuild the culture. So there's fraternity. And the fraternity comes from tertiaries, third order members, that's what tertiaries are, who come together at least once a month for meetings. They support themselves in the meetings. They, 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 they talk about different spiritual things. They work on some kind of apostolate that might need to happen. They identify the sick members of the group who need to be visited or cared for. So you already develop a system. So many don't have extended family anymore. And if they don't have extended family, the third order helps with that by providing not only for them if they fall on hard times, because all the third order members put money in a hat at each meeting, and that money gets put aside to help its members or some other charitable cause that they decide to use the money for. Okay? They make sure to visit the sick members and other members. 
but they, 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 you have a whole team, a whole troop of people out there that are now identifying good works that need to be done, and they're able to go around doing good things. That means the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. How many of them do you ever do? You know you almost do none of them. We, don't, we almost don't do any of those. We just talk about them and try to feel good about them. But really, all the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, we should try to be exercising those in some way. But in all honesty and all fairness, they're not easy to do today. We don't know where to go. We don't know who to talk to. We don't know where to give our money. You know, you don't know where the money's going. It's just a difficult situation. So there's fraternity. Also to pray with the fraternity. It creates these little Christian societies. Kind of like what we have already with the Latin Mass community, but now you have people that all come together that are following the same spirituality and the same rule of life, and you're supporting each other in that to get each other to heaven. It seems to me that it's also very much a deepening of the confirmation grace. We talk about confirmation, we're confirmed, but how often do we think about utilizing our confirmation grace? You know, honestly, it doesn't come up much because it's not part of our culture. Some of you might do it more than others, but really we don't think about our confirmation grace all that much. It is the grace that gives us the ability to go out into the world and be Christ and to be crucified, right? We need that grace. The third order is in, it's, it's like an active living of that confirmation grace. And so I already kind of mentioned it, but they said to our Lord, Lord, are there few who, who are, are, are there few that are saved? But he said to them, strive to enter by the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, shall seek to enter and shall not be able. But when the master of the house has gone in and has shut the door, and you shall begin to stand without and knock at the door and say, Lord, open to us. And he answers, shall say to you, I know you not whence you are. The commentary is, shall seek, shall desire to be saved, but for want of taking sufficient pains and being thoroughly and earnest, uh, being thoroughly and earnest, shall not attain. Many of us come from, well, we all do. We're all Americans. We come from an American culture that is steeped in materialism and capitalism. We naturally strive after success and to own. We want to have a bigger house because we have more money. We want to have a better car because we have more money that can get us a better car. We're always trying to do it a little bit more. And you know it by the bills that come in every month. St. Francis strove, and the great first third order members strove to live in actual poverty. That is actual detachment from the things of this world. The great, the first great tertiary, uh, Blessed Lucasio of uh, Pozzibondo, and his wife was Bonadonna. It's a strange name, good woman. His wife's name was good woman. They were the first third order members. And Lucasio, blessed Lucasio, was a friend of St. Francis when St. Francis was still a cloth merchant. Lucasio was a very avaricious man. He just sought after wealth. And he was really hard on people. And then somehow God gave him a grace and he converted. He sold basically everything he had, retained just enough land that he could harvest crops on it to take care of himself, and everything else that he had, he used for everyone that needed it. He lived in great penance, and that way him and his wife, they both agreed, because it's the best way to do it, to have the husband and wife agree to live in that way. And they used everything they could come up with to help other people, but they kept exactly what they needed to sustain themselves. That's what poverty is. It's not to live, not to use the words that, that confuse us, to live in poverty and squalor. No, no, we're not supposed to live in squalor. We're to, we're to be detached from things. We don't need a car that when you open the door, it has a hologram with, with an emblem there that, so, you, so, you don't, you know, so, so you don't miss your step and all the other perks that we can get in life. But, but really, if we think about a, a car that costs $10,000, will it work? Yeah, it'll work. Nowadays, they actually go, they, you can drive them a long time. You get like a Toyota, 
I'm not trying to make a sales pitch for Toyota. <laughs> the point is, is that we have, to, we have to realize our culture. We have to know from because we are sons and daughters of our of our cultural experience. What is it and how can we break from that cultural experience to live as true Catholics and sons and daughters of God so that we can make Christ present wherever we go and make sure that when we die, we go straight to heaven? Because that is possible. But it's not possible unless we live a heroic lifestyle. Right? So let's say a quick prayer. Amen. the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Agimus tibi gratis omnipotens Deus, per universis et benedicis tuis, qui vivis et reignas in secula seculorum. Amen. Immaculate mediators of all graces, pray for us. Holy Father, St. Francis, pray for us. Father, Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.